Oh. Oh. Well, hello. Oh, the Reynolds are alive. That's the good news. I'd like to say... Oh, we're tired. That's one way to put it. You know, I have been struggling to even get an opportunity to sit down and make a video at all. Our life got turned inside out in the last couple of weeks. You know, mostly like, man, 10, yeah, about two weeks. I put out that uh, previous video. Weep with those who weep. I'll tell you, you might just get an endless opportunity to weep with those who weep when you go through seasons like that. It's amazing how quick you can go from the absolute mountaintop to the literal valley. But you know what? In everything, in every season, give thanks. I'm going to do my best not to just completely complain about any type of circumstances, you know? Because there's enough people that are going through hardships and calamities who can complain about their circumstances. Big perspective shifts that are out there and available to each and every one of us whenever we really want to. In an age of endless opportunities to find information, you can get a real quick perspective game change by comparing yourself to the least of these. You know what I mean? I spent a good long time researching the conflict over there in the biggest open air prison in the world. You know, that's an eye opener. You spend a lot of time about that. There's a lot of people that ask me for political commentary on these shows and interviews. I don't post all of those. Yeah, for those of you that don't know, I've had an endless barrage of assaults in the last couple of weeks from my website to different platforms that I post on to payment methodologies. I, like my family got put front and center in the crosshairs of some really heavy oppositional stuff. Like not to mention our entire life circumstances, where we live, where we sleep, where we eat, all those things got turned inside out very quickly too. But behind the scenes in the ministry world and in our labors, we got a cacophony of assault. So I don't post a lot of the interviews I do with all these other content creators and people that are out there because I can't talk about everything that I would like to on certain platforms or they literally delete it. I don't monetize any of my stuff, you guys. I don't, I don't, mer I don't seek to merchandise any of the content that I create. I believe that the truth is something we should buy and not sell. So that's fundamentally why I do it that way. But it also still leaves me opportunities to just be destroyed content just removed anyways that's just one component of it you know like i said no, i'm just gonna read job one the rolling barrage let's just go to job for a second let's commiserate with our uh, brother from another mother for a second here you know there's some in the great battle of the ages war of the ages there's some incredible pertinent pieces of information about what job suffers for those of you that have the uh, scriptures translations it's in a, a different place after the, 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 the wonderful works of Psalms and Proverbs. Tehlim Malachi. Let's go there. You know, there's this battle of the gods. You know what I'm saying, you guys? That might be a foreign thing. I'm not a pantheist, right? I'm not ascribing to a pantheistic worldview. But understand, there's other mighty ones other than the Most High. Other immortals that we're fighting against. And some of them have different agendas than the Most Highs. You know? This... I did. Good news from all this crazy turning inside out. I got access to my library for a brief moment in time before I had to put it all back away again. Carl Teichreb's book, The Game of Gods, one of my absolute favorite reads. I'm diligently going through page by page on a lot of these recommended reads, and uh, I've been wanting that. That's the temple of man in the age of re-enchantment. It's like, it's really mechan mechanistically, I don't know, it's very specifically detailed going through how did we get to where we are today, to where this rising of this kind of postmodernism, this social, this social revolution to change people from biblical morality and any constraints of it to this completely different other than socially, politically correct ideology that's really trying to seek to bring about the augmentation of everything defined, structured. Bear with me if I'm all over the place, you guys. I'm incredibly sleep deprived, utterly exhausted. 
internally, externally. My daughter's smiling though. Hello. She's happy. Praise Yah. I'm hanging on the rhododendron. Good for you, honey. You should do some hanging on that rhododendron. Good job. I'm hanging on by a thread. <laughs> she just laughs. There was a man in the land of Uts whose name was Yob, and that man was perfect and straight, and one who feared Elohim and turned aside from evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him, and his possessions were seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred female donkeys and a very large body of servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons went and had a feast in the house of each on his day. Birthdays. Not a good idea. And sent and invited their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it came to be when the days of feasting had gone round that Job would send and set them apart. And he would rise early in the morning and offer ascending offerings, the number of them all. For Job said, It might be that my sons have sinned, yet blessed Elohim in their hearts. This Job always did. And the day came to be that the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah, and Satan also came with them. You see this? So up in the heavenlies, third heaven, Yahuwah's got this throne room. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's other thrones up there. Don't forget it. Naomi and I were reading about the 24 elders that sit on thrones up there. Quite a prestigious place to be. But there's these other immortals that come and present themselves. Sons, B'nai Ha Elohim. They're all over in the book of Job. Genesis. They're all over the scriptures. It's important to understand. This is the paradigm shift that is so profound from the Old Testament, right? And the renewed covenant, the New Testament later on, that the sons of Elohim they're talking about here, these other immortals, later on in the scriptures through the covenanted work of the Messiah, we get to be called children, sons and daughters of Elohim. And we get to be the ones who actually go into the place of rulership over and against these mighty ones, these other immortals. Doesn't you know, doesn't it like Paul said, don't you know you're going to judge angels, immortals? How's it going? I'm drinking water. You're drinking water? <laughs> How's life, Jubilee Jane? Tastes like dirt. Tastes like dirt. That's because I'm stirring up dirt right here with my feet. <laughs> I would suggest drinking upstream of my feet. Because I'm stirring it up, ladies. I'm stirring it up. Yeah. I would use that, if you're going to drink this, Straight up, I'd go. I'd go to the headwaters right up that way. Why do we? Why should we go to the headwaters to drink? What, have you seen any critters in this water? No. Think about it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Do you want to eat the critters or no? no. How about those little wiggly maggot-looking creatures? No. I just picked up one of the maggot freak shows not too long ago, right out of this spot. Got a crazy marvel. Look at this freak show. How the heck is this thing in the water? Look at this. Good gosh. Oh, he's wiggling underneath my fingers in a creepy. Oh, he's so creepy. No. Oh. This is how I feel right now. Like this stinking grub creature crawling through a creek, mire, muck. Desperate to get to the pure flowing waters that are just beyond reach. Oh. Life is ridiculous. Tell me about it, dude. Not the place to drink it totally unfiltered. Go up yonder, find where it's oozing out of a rock, drink there. Or you could use the life straw too. Where did you put it? It's here. Don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Important word, right? This is where it comes from. This is very important. If you don't have this understanding, you're going to be totally lost in a lot of the wonderful mysteries of what was revealed later on after the Messiah came. Because this is fundamentally why there's a major war against us. Why these other beings hate us. Because they think it's preposterous that creatures of soil would ever have an opportunity to rule over them, that they should ever submit to us, right? This is where the whole rebellion stuff started. Got to understand, it's a, it's a mighty important reason as to why we wrestle against not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers and authorities and dominions, all these other mighty ones. This is what we're fighting against. 
they came to present themselves before Elohim. And you know what? This is where it all starts. And some of you guys are experiencing this. Just great war taking place against you. And Yahuwah said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered Yahuwah and said, From diligently searching in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And Yahuwah said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and straight one, one who fears Elohim and turns aside from evil? And Satan answered Yahuwah and said, Is Job fearing Elohim for naught? Have you not made a head around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the lands. But stretch out your hands, please, and strike all that he has, if he would not bless you to your face. And Yahweh said to Satan, See, all that he has is in your hand. Only do not lay a hand on himself. And Satan went out from the presence of Yahuwah. And the day came to be when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brother, the firstborn. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding alongside them. When Sheba fell upon them and took them away, and they struck the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to inform you. While he was still speaking, Another also came and said, The fire of Elohim fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to inform you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Kasdim formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them away, and they struck the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to inform you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brother the firstborn. And see, a great wind came from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young men. They are dead. And I alone have escaped to inform you. Then Job rose up, tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and did obeisance. And he said, Naked, I came from my mother's womb and naked I returned there. Yahuwah has given and Yahuwah has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahuwah. In all this, Job did not sin, nor ascribe wrongness unto Elohim. The beauty of this is here's a man who has what the immortals perceive to be the foundation of his joy, his assuredness, insight. We have opportunistic hunters seeking to steal, kill, and destroy, right? They're looking for ways to ravage and sweep our feet out from under us so they can come down for a killing blow, right? They're looking for ways to set us up, in this instance, to curse Yahuwah. The imperative here, very important, that's the goal. Curse Yahuwah. Get Job to curse him. Take away his hedge of protection. You know, this, this you wanna talk about a real force field, a real spiritual force field physiological, spiritual force field that protected Job comes from the word of Yahuwah. When Yah says it, that man's protected. When Yah says otherwise, he's not. It's a serious thing. That's removed. And so what does he target? He targets the areas that for him are like, this is all that Job's life is. Okay, the next instance when these other mortals come back to present themselves, give a report. It's like an intelligence committee who's gathering together and holding counsel. He's like, let me take his physical health. You know, then he strikes him with these horrific sores. And he still, even in all this, Job doesn't sin with his mouth and curse Yahuwah. There's this resistance that he has internally, right? My contention is always, it's the roots. It's always what you're rooted in that holds you upright amidst the battering of the storm. Because they're inevitable. Every one of us has storms that we face in our life. The one that started so much of this a couple weeks ago with some of our friends and the circumstances they were dealing with. And then it just went from that friend to another friend, to another friend, to another friend, to where it was like calculated strikes on the people that we loved. Very precise, very devastating into all kinds of different people that we had. It was like an, a massive onslaught, right? And then it got, it, it branched out from there, right? And we've been around enough on the front line to recognize it when it's coming and to just understand we're going from like the season of kind of thriving, almost ease of burdens in a lot of ways to just an absolute full on kick in the teeth 
grind in the dirt, crawl bare knuckled up the slope of a mountain, season of life. We're in that one where we're just, like I said, it's somebody the other day. I'm like, I'm just, I'm purely in survival mode. I'm pure. I'm trying to find a place for my wife to stay. That's not mold infested. Like that was priority number one in my life again. I haven't had to go down to that level of like, just find somewhere to sleep that's clean and safe and food for my fam. Like that level, they call it a hierarchy of needs. But there's seasons in life where you literally go, it goes down to that real quick, really fast. We've gone through that so many times though, over the years, that it's kind of like, we're, we're pretty experienced at it. And it helps, it helps to buffer it. It doesn't make it easy, it just helps to buffer it. I was crying in a hotel lobby with my daughters the other morning, you know, it's like, Still sucks, still burdened and exhausted of it. So then you gotta reduce your life down to what are the things you're thankful for. An attitude of gratitude is the way we remind ourselves. Like for my children, they're really helpful to me to keep the perspective better because Naomi goes into a mindset of just absolutely loves packing. She loves packing, she loves organizing. She, she has moved so many times, she's very insulated to it. And for her, it's like a new season of change. Who knows what it's gonna bring, right? For her, it's exciting and it's an anticipatory, like, we'll see what happens next, because she doesn't know. Well, the Reynolds, this is what we do sometimes when we're just... When babies are napping. When babies are napping we, and we... And we take a big cart and we, we came out and we're, and we're riding on it and we're going and checking out the entire hotel. Every room. We go into the places that are under construction. We try to see what each of these doors opens to. And we went in the pool. We went in the pool. We check out the fitness know, centers. Yeah, and we I, look and at I, everything. And I ate some food. Yep, and we learn about emergency signs. Huh. Look at the cow on the bell. We learned about emergency signs. Cow bell. What did you learn about the Look, red that signs? That one's open, Dad. What did you learn about the red signs? The emergency. What is it for? Fire and stuff. Mm -hmm. Because what? What's that one? Me. What's that I one almost took the sailing. What's that? There you go. Lots to learn. This is just what the Reynolds life is like sometimes. Sometimes it's just pretty ordinary hotel oh, life. Oh, a lot less foresty, a lot less wildernessy. But we make it work. Dad, pull us. Hello. Ada. Usually, too. Likewise. The twins are just the twins, you know? My thunder is like 38 pounds. Give a round of applause to Pearl for TV. Yeah. <laughs> Cracking teeth. Cracking teeth and no one even knows, Miss Pearl. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have Mill Squawky over here. <laughs> slug. Incredibly heavy child. He's not a slug. He's a sluggard, I guess. Not a sluggard. Wrong word. <laughs> I feel like I'm picking up a sack of lead every time I pick him up. It's unbelievable. And all things rejoice. Needless to say, each of us weathers it differently. We're living very, very tiny again. We had a year. We had one year. Almost exactly of living in a more spacious environment. And it was such a gift. It was, a, it was an unbelievable gift. And that literally couldn't have happened without the unbelievable generosity and support that so many people extended to us a year ago, a little over a year ago, in March. People just opened up their doors to us. They opened up everything to us to try to help us. We had people come in and help us move so many times, so many times. We were out in the Ozarks back then, you know. We haven't even told you guys about that move, but we left the Ozarks, hallelujah, for us not to diminish any of you that lives there, that wants to live there, just listen. It's a rough place to live. There's some beautiful, wonderful things about it, but the Ozarks is four full extreme seasons and it's arduous place to live. There's some parts of it that are much more conducive to life. There are some parts of it that are much more conducive to cults. 
Gotta say it, y'all. There's some psychos out there. Lots of them. They're abounding in fruitfulness of evil, too. However, there's some incredibly rare, precious gemstones. Some of the best people we've ever met in our lives that are out there as well. But we were beyond elated to come back out east towards the Appalachian Mountains. Our favorite place in the world that we have ever been. Still is. Beyond measure. We love it tremendously. So that was a, a major change that happened back at the end of last year. Well, we did it. We did it! We clawed our way! Clawed our way out. You betcha. Woo. Everyone is sick. Whether diarrhea, <laughs> cough, snotopotamus, but we're leaving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Long journey. Many days. But we're ready to go. Oh, Moses. You ready? I Let's am go. ready. Let's go. Yay! Well, how's the first road trip, leg of the road trip going? It's it's going okay. You know, Abraham, I've changed, I think, four diapers in the car so far, and we've been in the car three hours. He's uh, having a little bit of diarrhea mm. to just add it to the pile. Add it to the pile. Literally. One pile at a time. Mm -hmm. Jane, have you tell me about the car, car trip? What was your favorite thing so far? Um, that I got some in popcorn. Oh. Snacks make the road Nay, trip. Nay, what's your favorite fun. thing about the road trip so far? Mm, I don't know. How are you feeling? No. Not good. How about you, Jubilee? Mm -hmm. Not good. Well, it's fun. We can sit in a little spot. Take a break. How are you, bro? Look at my rash. Mr. Krusty's. Chelsea with a rash. Don't know what caused it. I think it might be stress. I wonder why. <laughs> Two sick babies. And a wild life. There you go. But it's good to be on the road. <sighs> she was it's crying because be she was happy to be on the road. It's good to be back on the road. <clears throat> of our heart that just feels peace being on the road. Out on the open road. Going wherever Yahuwah leads. And it feels... It feels safer. It feels safe. It feels good. Familiar, huh? Familiar. <laughs> a big precipitous move made a big difference. So we've just, we, we've had this like year of kind of finally getting out of the RV, finally starting to live in homes again, which was amazing for my mental health, my just overall wellness of my soul, because I struggle in the tiny spaces with the tiny children all the time but we did it for four and a half years and because of it you know what we're like we're pretty slick you get streamlined real quick like my wife is she's efficient she's shockingly efficient she's an amazing lady she's highly adaptable and so because of that she's just like back into the groove starting to figure it out dial things in again you know but she made a comment she's like please don't get mad and angry again like don't be grumpy all the time you know and the truth is i, I battled constant frustration and anger in the tiny space, like lots of just pain of screaming children noises and shaking house and water pipe problems and leaking. And it's not easy living tiny with lots of children and nap time and being hyper paranoid all the time that somebody's gonna wake somebody else up who's trying to nap and trying to sleep. Like there's just different challenges. The good side of it is you're outside so much more. Like instead of my studio office space that I had, Here's the forest. I tried to set up yesterday in a woodshed, but there's mold in there. And I was like, dadgummit, I can't do it in here. My nose is running. My throat is itching. I can't set up my office in here. You know what? But to the great outdoors, we return. It's a new season. It'll be new chapters. I was so excited to be putting out videos for you guys constantly, like almost every day. It's not likely going to happen for a while, you guys. We're... Resetting expectations. Let's go to Romans 1. Let me show you some pearls I found amidst my tears. Because <laughs> each season brings its own fruit, you know? Romaim. I start diving back into my chapters. Like when, when I go through the seasons of suffering and torment and torture and anguish, nightmares, when I'm waking up for the 20th time because we're all sleeping in one room. Like... You're just crying, desperate to not be in it, 
praying, like you've never prayed more in your life that just one baby would sleep and not wake up the other baby, that wouldn't wake up the other child, that wouldn't wake up the mom, that wouldn't wake up you, that wouldn't wake up the other child. Like, it's a cacophony of that, you know, and we've had some good long reprieve of it. There's not enough earplugs in the world to drown out the sounds of everybody being noisy at times. James, ready? James. The book of James. It's not as actually what it's called. Book of Jacob. Yeah, definite, definitely. Yaakov, a servant of Elohim and of the master Yeshua Messiah, to the twelve tribes who are in the dispersion. Greetings, my brothers. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the proving of your belief works endurance. And let endurance have a perfect work, so that you be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of Elohim, who gives to all generously, without reproach, and it shall be given to him. But... He should ask in belief, not doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man should not think that he shall receive whatever from the master. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. See this imperative here. Count it a joy when you suffer trials because they're producing, ah, to me this means the roots are growing deeper. They're looking for new things to mine and, and hunger for, right? Like, they want more nutrients. You need more nutrients so that you can bear fruit. I think all the time about things like oaks, okay? Ouch. Ouch. The oaks of righteousness, as we're compared to all the time. Oaks are not something that bear seeds and bear fruit every year. They're not consistent like that. They're, they're of a type of family. There's acorns all around me. Let me show you an acorn, just so you guys can understand. The beauty of nature, Nate, being out in nature. Maybe I'll be more nature and less nathan -y. Acorns last year was a masting year for the white oaks, at least different parts of the country. They all bear fruit abundantly in endless, crazy, numerous amounts all at once. Oaks, white oaks, red oaks, two main species, kind of varieties of them. They all will bear out a huge amount of fruitfulness all at once, simultaneously everywhere. It's unbelievable. Like they all talk to each other, like nature's way smarter than the doofuses think it is way more complex, way more beautiful, way more intimately connected than anything you can even imagine. Look to nature for the lessons. And we're going to go to Romans 1 because I have to do that when I'm depressed. This one, right? Last year was the masting year. So every three, five, or seven years, there's this overabundant production of acorns suddenly all at once. Hazel, hickory nuts are similar to this. There's different nut varieties that are like this, where they just create an endless quantity, cover the forest floor, and then they'll be like off. They like won't produce any for a while. And it could be three years, could be five years, seven years, could be six. They have this like cycle. And every time I think about it, this is like how most people, most believers are really like this. And that to me is indicative that that variety of tree needs to do so much collective harvesting and collecting and storing up of nutrients so that it can produce so abundantly that the birds, the ravens that are there to like pick it all off, you know what I'm talking about? Go to Luke 8. These bad boys. Parable of the sower, son. The sons of Satan. You know those guys. You know. Synagogue of Satan. Black robe priests. You know, all the people that are like destined to destroy, steal everything that's ever been worked for and labored for. You know what I'm talking about here. You ready? And it came to be afterward that he went through every city and village proclaiming the good news of the reign of Elohim. This is super important. The good news is the thing that's going to save us from the nightmare of despair, and despondency. Because the good news is deliverance. Fundamental spiritual warfare principle right here. Here's your principles of expelling darkness. And you guys want scary, vicious, nightmare-looking, exorcist-style, demonic warfare stuff? Spiritual warfare's predominant methodology is farmers. It's sowing the word. That's it. Advancing the kingdom of Yahuwah, spreading the good news. That's the main methodology of spiritual warfare. That's like the actual main tactic of spiritual warfare is to continue to sow the word. Okay, every day. Right now, I plant 20 to 50 new plants every day, all over the place. That's it. I'm like in a season where I'm not going to stop planting seeds, period. Because I understand, you know what? I could be gone tomorrow from wherever it is that I'm sojourning on. I'm not a settler. Every time I get excited to maybe be the settler, I have reminded, reminisce quickly that I might just be the sojourner for a little longer. And that's okay. Hallelujah. Check this out. 
And the twelve were with him, and certain women who were healed of wicked spirits and sicknesses, Miriam called from Magdala, out of whom had come seven demons. She had the super intense, awesome, crazy testimony. You know, like when people sit around, they're like, holy smokes, that chick was totally delivered from seven demons. Saw him come out snarling, crabbing, puking out all kinds of crazy, like curses and violent stuff. It's not so always so graphic, but believe me, you guys, sometimes it's, it's brutal. It's, it's disgusting. It's awful because you get to see somebody being taken over by something other than human. It's a horribly sad, brutal, and often embarrassing experience for that person. It's not something that you want to be publicized. Trust me. And Yochanan, the wife of Kuza, the manager of Herodes, and Shoshana, and many of the others who provided for him from their resources. So he's got like a whole team of people here. This is like an absolute massive ministry team of people. Some that were healed of diseases, others that are physically the support team, those that are providing hospitality and resources to empower them to be able to do their ministry. It's an incredibly unique collective of people, right? And when a large crowd had gathered and those who were coming to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some indeed fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the birds of the heaven devoured it. That's the sons of Satan. And other fell on rock, and when it grew up, it withered, because it had no moisture. And others fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and with it choked it. And others fell on the good soil and grew up, having yielded a crop of a hundredfold. Having said this, he cried, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And his taught ones were asking him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you this, to you it has been given, to know the secrets of the reign of Elohim, but to the rest in parables, seeing that they do not see and hearing that they do not understand. This is the parable. The seed is the word of Elohim. And those by the wayside are the ones who hear it, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, lest having believed, they should be saved. This is the fundamentals of spiritual warfare, is we have an adversary who seeks to steal that which has been sowed in, the word of truth that's been sown into the hearts of men. And as soon as he has an opportunity, he's going to steal that away. He's going to uproot it, take it away from there, and he's going to fill it with a counter truth, right? And those on the rocks are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of trial, fall away. Now, here's an interesting thing about seeds. I've been studying, I had been back then in the other season of my life just two weeks ago, all of these things about seeds. There's this incredible guy, Stephen Sokobiak, okay? Permaculture Orchards. Fantastic. Can't recommend him enough. Thank you, Billy Bonds, for turning me on to his incredible work. But there's two ways you can start. There's lots of ways you can start seeds. One of the ways that these people have discovered, hey, you can have seeds. You know, you take your little seed pot and you go get your little seed mix, your planting mix, potting soil, whatever, from the store. And you put it in these little seed trays. And then you put your little seeds in there and you water them and you give them nice moisture and you give them nice warmth. And then when they sprout out, you put them in an up planter into a tinier pot or a little bit bigger pot. And then you keep this chain going until it's your time of the year where you can go put them in the ground and, and start it. There's another method where you give them horrible starting place. You go onto your property, wherever it is, find the worst possible soil you have in your environment. Go find pure sand. Like, go find brutal clay. Go find, like, terrible, terrible soil. Okay? Dirt. Go start with that stuff. Put the seed in there. Let it get started in that. Give it just enough moisture so it will germinate. And then totally none else. Don't you help that thing at all. You give it an absolutely brutal beginning phase. Because what happens with a seed is it puts out the first root that you see. They always come down, right? Roots, roots are drawn down. This is like they know. You can, look at, you can look at root systems. You can look at root systems like here behind me. This, this is a, the American rhododendron, okay? This thing is not becoming roots. This is part of its tree size, right? When its roots get exposed to air because they wash away like the hillside here. I'm in a little creek, right? Well, when you have torrential rains, stuff washes down. 
and then roots get exposed to air. Well, those things don't want to be exposed to air, so then they will suddenly start to create an outer layer that's like bark. They'll shield themselves off because that's not where they're supposed to be, right? But if you notice, roots generally don't go up ever, right? They almost never go up into the air. They know they want to go downhill. So when that first seed starts out, it's going to put that tap root, that first little root that goes whoop, it's an antenna. It has nothing to do with like the major root of the plant. It's, it is purely a probe into the soil. That thing's main job is to map the environment that it's in. It wants to know, am I in a place right now that's easy for me to thrive in or is it going to be difficult for me to thrive in? Because every one of these seeds contains the history of all the seeds that came before it from its mother and father, right? It's carrying the history of its ancestors. So all of the genetic expression, all of the unique expressions of different environmental pressures that every one of its ancestors has gone through is contained back in the back burner of the genetics of that plant. This is really important because that means that seed can unlock variables of potentials for how to endure the different environments that it's given. So if you give that seed ultra cushion, awesome, softy start, you're like, yeah, it's gonna be sweet and awesome out here, man. You're gonna love it. You're always gonna have all the right temperatures. You're gonna have all kinds of ease of life, you know? This is Satan's contention with Job. He's like, you gave him all the easy stuff. Give him all the hard stuff now and let's see if he's still fruitful or not. If instead you start the seed in the nightmares, you start the seed in the worst possible conditions, it suddenly wakes up and goes, oh no, man, this is not good, you guys. If we are going to make it out of this thing, if we're ever going to produce offspring, if we're ever going to be fruitful, we better give everything we absolutely ever got in order to do this. Now, there's some people that are forerunners in this. I encourage you to watch the videos below that talk about the fruitfulness of this test and experimentation program long term. I think they're 10, 12, 15 years that they've been trying this out. Those plants, and specifically, this is a lot of this is geared towards perennial stuff. Try this out with perennials, things that are going to be there year after year because you can see a longer term yield on this. So these guys that are planting out their orchards, the trees grow so much faster and are so much more fruitful and stronger and vigorous than the, that, that grew up in the abominable soil conditions than the ones that were started in the ideal conditions, even more so in outcompeting the other group, the control group, which would be one that is just planted direct to seed. In almost all circumstances with every plant, it's almost always preferable to just direct seed it into the soil of where it's going to be. That's great. But if you can, give it the awful right out of the gates, then put it in something better because from there, it's only uphill sun. It's going to do better. Anyways, as soon as I learned that lesson, I was like, this is, this is exactly how my life started. As soon as I saw that, I was like, my life, the beginning years of torture for me have meaning. It makes sense. Like I started in the worst possible conditions. I was given the most tortured, abysmal, abominated beginning that any person can imagine. Worse than most people. People can't sit down and listen to me talk about my testimony almost ever. Very few people can sit and weather it, let alone imagine living it. You know, I can share an iota of it. But I've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages that have never seen the light, that have never seen the light of day. They're down here in the muck of my life still. Those were the starting conditions where the seed germinated, the seed of faith in my life. Because into those conditions is literally where the seed of faith, the word of faith, got sown into me. But I believed it. And it was like the first root that got started in me and planted in me was a hope for a better tomorrow. That was it. There was this ideal belief that there would someday come a way of breaking out of the system. There would come deliverance for me. And I knew fundamentally in the innermost portion of my being that that deliverance was tied to justice, that they were inseparable. And when I finally had a reconciliation with the version of the Messiah that I'd been given, the dead naked guy on the cross version, the idol version that most people are raised with, that guy versus the king of glory, that guy, ah, there was a great restoration of faith in my soul because the idol version that most people are raised with is weak and soft and impotent, not the version of who he is actually represented as is Messiah ben David, the conquering king, right? Very different version, very important for me, fundamentals in my life. <sighs> Critical need for me because I could never have joy abound in my heart again until I had that. 
like the word brings joy. The word is the, the deliverance that I needed. Check this out for a second. Romans 1. For I am, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the good news of Messiah, for it is the power of Elohim for deliverance. The power of Elohim for deliverance to everyone who believes, to the Yahudi first and also to the Greek. For in it, the power of deliverance of the good news, Elohim is revealed from belief to belief as it has been written, but the righteous shall live by belief. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth of unright in unrighteousness because that which is known of Elohim is manifest among them for Elohim has manifested it to them. So you have two major wars going on right here. The good news of deliverance, the good news of the kingdom of the Messiah, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of the Messiah is at hand, right? The good news of who the Messiah is, what he did from the beginning all the way to the end, the advancement of his kingdom, the establishment of the reconciliation between the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the restoration of the Gentiles and the Israelites. All of this story contained herein is the good news that offers deliverance to those who believe, right? The enemy, the adversary understands that's the weapon to deliver people from the bondage, from the snares, from those pitiful, worthless conditions that they've been born into and to give them the place that they were to abound in, the environmental conditions that they were supposed to always be in. The reason the cover of my book, Snatched from the Flames, is what it is, is because that is the Messiah reaching his hand into my life and yanking me out of that horrible, blackened, fiery soil of death and despair and despondency that I was raised in. The generational iniquity. I was planted next to the streams of iniquity of the fallen ones. And you know what? He transferred me from that river of death and he put me by streams of living water that I would never thirst again. He showed me this is where life comes from. That's what the story of deliverance really was for me and for my children. As, as trying of our circumstances might be, he puts us near streams of living water. He's the one who waters my soul. And you know what? I can give thanks to him. I can rejoice at him amidst all circumstances because great is his deliverance amidst every one of these seasons. I know that, you know what? He's putting me into a season of refinement. He's putting me into a season of testing, of compression, of simplicity. He's taking away a lot of the circumstances in my life and giving me something new. My wife's alive. My children are alive. And I can rejoice still, you know? Thank him for that. At the end of the day, when we all get tested, we gotta be able to rejoice in all circumstances. In everything, give praise, give thanks, right? Because we do have, we have a reason to rejoice. I have a reason to sing, you know? I do. Because at the end of the day, Yahweh is still El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one the great everlasting provider. And he'll provide for us everything, including deliverance from those who suppress the truth. Because we're in a society, we're in a time where the goal of the nations is to suppress the truth, where they're incentivizing the suppression of the truth so that people are without an absolute understanding of reality. Remember, the word truth means reality. And there's fundamentally an augmented version of reality that they're trying to perpetuate upon people so that you don't know, was this actually generated in the demonic mind of an artificial intelligence or was this something that authentically took place was this an actual event or is it not you know like even for instance the vision of nuclear war that you've been given throughout your life the threat of nuclear war that's been used as a way of swaying the nations into compliance coercion control like that creation came from one studio one movie, movie film production studios called Lookout Mountain in Laurel Canyon in California. All of it, it's like 16,000, maybe 19,000 films that were produced in a film studio by the United States military. Highly classified secret place. All of that stuff. That's where it was all filtered through so that the suppression of the truth 
could be given its new facade, right? This is the augmenters of reality back then. The version of it that we get today is highly advanced, right? And so we're, we're sitting here trying to sift through what's reality and what's non-reality. And it just depends on who it is that's feeding you your information. What's one feeding you your narrative? And so anytime I read in here, the enemy's goal is to suppress the gospel of deliverance. And that's the preeminent target that he's got to battle against. So that's why there's all these insulative factors that throughout your life you've been brainwashed with to keep you from ever coming to a place where you could see the truth, see reality for what it was, and hear it for what it was. Mary of Magdala, Miriam of Magdala, had demonic hordes swallowing up her ability to see the world as it really was. The kingdom of darkness has this infectious capacity to parasitically feed off of us and the dark emotions, those negative feelings, thoughts, the, 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 the hopelessness that we feel in those circumstances. It's, it's the fuel source for the demonic. It's, it's literally, it's bread and butter. And so its entire world's mission is to keep people from the breakthrough of joy, like the freedom that comes from the spiritual manifestation of freedom, authentic freedom. The enemy's goal is to deceive people from ever coming to grips with that. One of the other places that this is put out best, like the, the word that's used for suppression, suppressors, is also hinder, restrain, retain, to hold back the progress of. It's The word is, is uh, what is it? Kateko. Kateko. Right? Who suppress the truth of righteousness. Hey, in unrighteousness, they take, literally, they take authority of the truth. They take it away from people. That's like their entire goal. They want to hold possession of the truth. And this is why the goal right now of the enemy and his dark agents is to take people's adv take advantage of what they believe to be the truth and hold principle over it so that you are getting a filtered message. You're only giving what they choose to give you. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible qualities have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, both his everlasting power and mightiness for them to be without excuse. This is why it's critical in their agenda for them to hide the very nature of creation itself, that you don't understand what this world is, how it works or how it operates, that you would look through the lens of mechanistic creative forces, Newtonian worldview, that everything is these mechanical forces. That means they can be controlled by behaviorism, man and machine. They're all basically synonymous with animals. That, that reductionistic mindset changed the lens with which mankind saw the world through a supernatural creative lens and it diminished it down to this horrible brutish reality and it took from people their ability to perceive the wonders the awesomeness the glory that's in his creation the hand of our creator that's hiding inside his nation his creation because although they knew elohim they did not esteem him as elohim nor gave thanks but became vain in their reasonings and in their undis and their undiscerning heart was darkened. Matehayo, their heart was darkened like an abyss. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. That word vain, like beca they became vain in their understandings, is used all throughout the scriptures. This is why, like, one of the key tenets of like our channel has always been to murder vanity. Like, if you guys haven't watched my wife and I's video there on Killing vanity, murdering vanity, like why my wife no longer wears makeup. Some of you guys see videos of us from before, but it's vastly different people, you know? Like, I used to not look like this unkept vine, you know what I'm saying? This is by design. Like, the reason the Nazarite vow is also beneficial is to murder vanity, is to take away the whole primping and pruning and maintaining yourself to look a certain way, to no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world. Like, when I read that, I'm like, man, I think he's really serious. I think we're not supposed to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Like, the version of man that most people are given with this clean, shaven, short hair version, that's all very Romanistic. This is totally, like the great Holy Roman Empire's version of what men should be in masculinity that was exported to the world. Non-normative for thousands of years prior to this moment. That was not the version of what masculinity was. Men grow hair, shockingly effective for protecting yourself and your throat from getting it cut. It's amazing stuff. It's like a giant antenna array to keep you tuned into the kingdom of righteousness. But the society as a whole is like, no, shave that thing off. Conform to this version of suit and tie. You know, other places it's wig and tie. It's a freak show level of theater. You know, like you're sitting, you're sitting in that hotel lobby when I was crying earlier. And I was like, 
they had the sportscasters, you know, like the idol, the idolaters for the sports community, the priest class of the sports world. And I was just noticing how every single version of every person that I saw upon there basically looked the same. And I was like, huh, there's not a set apart man on the show. It's kind of interesting. You can like immediately identify some of the oddities of people that are like outliers in that system. Something to consider. We go after vanity because fundamentally our society is catered to this. This has been the gods of vanity forever, you guys. One of the main immortals that we wrestle against is vanity. The way the world wants us to appear to be in the sight of other people. This is what controls most people's decision-making processes. Whether they're, they're thinking through the lens of what my family is going to think of me, my friends, my boss, my employees. All of these different lenses of how other people perceive us is so deeply ingrained to us. It's our idols. It's often the idols that we have to address first when coming into the kingdom of righteousness because people fear men. We fear men, these worthless idols. Let's go over to 2 Kings. Oh, is it 2 Kings? No, 1 Kings. 1 Kings 16. I had a deep dive on Shabbat. I came out with some gold. Like I said, check this out. This is important. We're going back to the days of the two kingdoms, two houses, house of Israel, house of Judah, war zone, all that time frame. You ready? Check this out. And after many days, verse 1 Kings 18. And after many days, it came to be that the word of Yahuwah came to Eliyahu in the third year saying, oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. Hold on a second. 1 Kings 16. I'm like, no, let's hang on a second. I hear you, little buddy. You tell him about it. Oh, I read to you guys this the last time. 1 Kings 16. Man, in the 27th year, verse 15. In the 27th year of Asa, sovereign of Yehuda, Zimri reigned seven days in Terza. Seven-day kingdom, son. That's not good. And the people were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the people who were encamped heard it and said, Zimri has conspired and also struck the sovereign. So all Yisrael set up Omri, the commander of the army, to reign over Yisrael that day in the camp. And Omri went up and all Yisrael with him from Gibbethon. And they besieged Terza. And it came to be when Zimri saw that the city was captured, that he went into the high place of the sovereign's house and burned the sovereign's house down upon himself with fire. And he died because of the sins which he had sinned in doing evil in the eyes of Yahuwah, walking in the way of Yeroboam and in his sin in which he had committed to make Yisrael sin. See, this is the guy who led the people into idolatry and the rest of the acts of Zimri and the conspiracy he made are they not written in the book of the annals of the sovereign of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half the people followed Tibni, son of Ginoth, to make him reign, and the other half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri were stronger than the people who followed Tibni, son of Ginoth. And Tibni died, and Omri reigned. So the commander of the army is reigning. In the 31st year of Asa, sovereign of Yehuda, Omri began, came sovereign over Israel and reigned 12 years. He reigned six years in Terza, and he bought the hill of Shamaron from Shemer for two talents of silver, and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built Shamaron, Samaria, you guys might be more familiar with, after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill. And Omri did evil in the eyes of Yahuwah, and did evil more than all those before him. And he walked in the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, in his sin by which he made Israel sin provoking Yahuwah, Elohim of Yisrael, with their worthlessness. This is the worthlessness that those that know the truth have. Like Omri is not a denier of Yahuwah as an Elohim, right? It's that he established the other Elohim instead. And this fundamentally is the reality of the rulers of darkness that sit in high places in our world. They fundamentally know about Yahuwah and his kingdom. The reality is, though, they are servants of the other immortals. They are servants of a pantheon of other mighty ones. And you know what? They serve and they're laboring to them. Worthless ones, right? The idols that these ones set up are worthless. And they give their minds to these worthless idols. And so many of them are just infecting the minds of, of, our, of our families, of our friends. They're 
incapable of hearing and receiving the truth because they're bowing down to these worthless idols. And we always think back to this reductionistic version of stupid cave people back then bowing down to gold cows. And they're like, oh yeah, that's the idols of the days. But they're infectious and deceptive in such a powerful way that the the deceitfulness of our hearts leads us to set up idols of all kinds, of all forms and versions all the time. Like they're always doing it. It says it here, claiming to be wise, they became fools and changed the esteem of incorruptible Elohim into the likeness of the image of a corruptible man. This, you guys, is the version of transhumanism. Like the form of atheism is a form of setting up man, corruptible man, as the Elohim, as your God, right? There is none, there's no God, they say, right? Because I, in my wisdom, am establishing a declarative truth that there is no God. I am God. This is the version of, I mean, that has been upheld for a long time. This comes, a lot of this, let me read from here for a second. Game of Gods, Carl Tykerib. Warrior on the front line, you guys. One of the few I got to know over the years that I was like, oh, refreshed by. This is, comes from the intellectual class of society, right? This is on page 94 in his chapter 5 called The Fuzzy Days. The postmodern mood was influenced by more than just scientific theory. Modern, modern, fine, oh, excuse me. The postmodern mood was influenced by more than just scientific theory. Modern philosophers, too, had greatly contributed to the new attitude. Long before the phrase postmodern was uttered, inst- intellectuals like Soren Kierkegaard and George Hegel introduced ideas that would lodge into the postmodern mind frame. Friedrich Nietzsche, an erudite and sophisticated German thinker noted for his sharp analysis of art and culture, was an important frontrunner. His arousal of moral skepticism and his critiques of reasoning and knowledge contributed to an atmosphere of questioning truth, of questioning. Since his death in 1900, Nietzsche's perspective on the modern ideas of truth, science, religion, and the limits of being all too human have become powerful points of academic debate and discussion. Nietzsche's popular legacy, however, was the Ubermensch, an allegorical superman freed of Christian bonds and charting a new course through the will to power the fierce desire for self-mastery and self-existence. Man as a construct of the stifling past will be superseded. Quote, Man is something that shall be overcome. What is ape to man? A laughingstock or painful embarrassment. Just the same shall man be to the Ubermensch. The Ubermensch is the meaning of the earth. Let your will say the Ubermensch shall be the meaning of the earth. Remain true the earth and do not believe those who speak to you of otherworldly hopes. They are poison mixers. As Zarathustra, the main character in Nietzsche's philosophical novel, said, Dead are all gods. Now we want the Ubermensch to live. It was a boast that was echoed through the 20th century. Quote, God is dead. God remains dead and we have killed him. How can we console ourselves? The murderer of all murderers, the holiest and the mightiest thing the world has ever possessed, has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water could we cleanse ourselves? What festivals of atonement? What holy games will we have to invent for ourselves? Is it the magnitude of this deed not too great for us? Do we not ourselves have to become gods merely to appear worthy of it? There's never a greater deed. And whoever is born after us will on account of this deed belong to a higher history than all of our history up to now. End quote. Stuart E. Kelly, a Christian philosopher of philosophy at Minot State College, State University, bridges Nietzsche and postmodernism. Nietzsche called for a new worldview that sloughed off the dead skin of Christianity and replaced it with the will to power, truth as a mobile army of metaphors, and a world where God is no longer relevant. Another 20th century thinker, the esteemed Spanish writer and philosopher, Jose Ortega, Y Gasset foreshadowed postmodernism in his critique of the rationalist point of view. But reality happens to be like a landscape possessed of an infinite number of perspectives, all equally voracious and authentic. The sole false perspective is that which claims to be the only one there is. Like John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one shall come to the Father except through me. That's one of those authoritative truth statements. 
that's the one that they're all eagerly contending with. If you notice, there's not a major PR campaign against the Islamists or the Judites. Like, there's this massive onslaught against those who have the declarative statement that comes from the words of the Messiah, Yeshua of Nazareth. Always has been, will fundamentally always be, the one that all of these contentious religions go to make their war over, including the atheistic religion. All of these ones have a major contention against those that hold a view or a perspective that's from one perspective. Albert Einstein's theory of relativity was important to Ortega's conception. The theory of Einstein is a marvelous proof of the harmonious multiplicity of all possible points of view. If the idea is extended to morals and aesthetics, we shall come to an experience history and life in a new way. Ortega wrote, each individual is an essential point of view in the chain. By setting everyone's fragmentary vision side by side, it would be possible to achieve a complete panorama of absolute and universally valid truth. This panorama, he postulated, is God's point of view, as God sees through the medium of mankind. Mankind is the visual organ of divinity. Such an idea imparts that God's knowledge is dependent upon man. This may be the case if God is nothing more than a postulate of humanity, a deity inseparable from the material cosmos. But the God revealed to the ancient Hebrew people stands apart. There's that set apartness, you know, that otherness. A being different than what the mind of man constructs. Nor would or could we construct this being. For our self-mastery is immediately challenged and ultimately dismantled by the judge whose standards are higher than human counsel. The Old Testament book of Isaiah asked a rhetorical question fitting to our discussion. Who has directed the spirit of Yahuwah? Or has his counselors taught him? With whom did he take counsel? And whom instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? The New Testament book of Romans offers this parable. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of Elohim. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of Yahuwah? Or who has become his counselor? This is the wonder of intellectuals who dance around in this facaded game of trying to pit their intellects against the intellect of El Shaddai. And let me tell you, this has been called upon as a, as, a, as a prophecy of what man would do forever because there's those who set up idols of stone and wood and there's those who set up man as the idol with which to be worshipped, right? This is why they have pushed the collective morality into that postmodernistic view where it comes from, definitions are come from the lens of many mouths, right? That there is no absolute. And as soon as you suppress that version of the truth, what you open up to is a house of ambiguity. This is truly Pan's labyrinth. And I mean Pan as in the deity, the satyr, which is a hybridized being that's half goat, half man, right? This is the depiction like, an occultist who needs not to be named. This is the Baphometic Pan, the satyr goat god that's half woman, half man, truly a transgenic creature of all things. That's where that agenda of idolatry is pushing the nations to the embracing of the, the literal Baphomet, to one that is even being ere erected in our state's capital buildings. Just an appalling thing. Let's go to Isaiah 40. That's where he was, he was quoting from Isaiah. When I'm uh, despondent as well and in despair, Isaiah is a good book to go. Hold on. Oh, I'm sitting on a bunch of screws. Isaiah 40. I like to read Isaiah 40, just through the end if you can. 43 through 60, some of my favorites. It's good ones here. Verse 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your Elohim. Speak to the heart of Yerushalayim and cry out to her that her hard service is completed, that her crookedness is pardoned, that she has received from the hand of Yahuwah double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of Yahuwah! Make straight in the desert a highway for your Elohim! Let every valley be raised and every mountain and hill made low, and the steep ground shall become level and the rough places smooth, and the esteem of Yahuwah shall be revealed, and all flesh together shall see it. For the mouth of Yahuwah has spoken, and the esteem of Yahuwah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall together see it. Excuse me. 
the voice said, cry out. And he said, what do I cry? All flesh is grass and all its loving commitment is like the flower of the field. Grass shall wither, the flower shall fade when the spirit of Yahuwah has blown on it. Truly the people is grass. Grass shall wither and the flower shall fade. But the word of our Elohim stands forever. You who bring good news to Zion, get up into the high mountain. Here's that good news again. Pay attention. I'm not talking about the Zionists. You know what I'm saying? We're not talking about those guys. I'm talking about the real good news. This is why it's just so frustrating. You know, like it, it ticks me off to no end. Because the version of what people have inherited and are seeing as Israel all the time, everywhere, is the monstrous, barbaric, genocidal, tyrannical, nightmare version that comes from the house of Satan. They are the spawn of Satan. You know what I'm saying? Like th that version that people are getting through the generation of their black mirrors, that is literally the handwork, the handiwork of Satan himself. That's literally his sons of servants, the sons of Belial as they're called through antiquity. That's their workmanship. That's the, those created and crafted in his image. That version is so idolatrous and so abominable to the true authentic form of the children of Israel. And that's why it's such a ferocious war of the words, information war. Because when people hear Israel over and over and over again branded with this, this, this curse continually, that version is designed and orchestrated to lead people down a path of hatred. Right? Vitriolic, retributive justice, wanting to see that place destroyed. That's by design. That's not the reality of who his people are, right? The children of Israel. Not the same thing by any stretch of the imagination. The version that we are given, right, that came from these British mandates, these British overlords from the American, Israeli, British establishment. Carol Quigley, y'all, go ahead and study Tragedy and Hope. Go and study the American English, Anglo American establishment. Great books, incredibly arduous, very liturgical, heavy, weighty books written by scholarly people that go through the examination of history of why we are where we are, where the, the, these things come from, and understanding like how that place got picked to be the version of where this unbelievable epicenter for war would take place, right? The genocidal, monstrous like birth center of World War III. Crazy stuff, you guys. You got to understand which lords, which Baals are fighting for that place. The Baals of the Rothschilds, the Baals of the Vatican, right? They're all these same deities that are fighting for the same places with different mighty ones like the Prince of Persia. Just a nonstop collective battle over there. Anyways, every time I see this, I understand. I hear the word Zion. They've equated the Zionist with this movement, right? They've, they've literally taken what was authenticity about the good news of Zion and turned it into that. It sucks. That's the stuff we're contending with. That's because there's that suppression of reality and the artificial version for people to think about. Poison this waters. You who bring the good news to Yerushalayim, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Yehuda, see your Elohim. See the master Yahuwah comes with strength and his arm rules for him. That's Yeshua. See his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He feeds his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs with his arm and carries them in his bosom, gently leading those who are with young, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and measured the heavens with a span and contained the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales, the hills in a balance. Who has meted out the spirit of Yahuwah or as his counselor taught him? With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of right ruling? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? See nations are as a drop in a bucket and are reckoned as dust on the balance. See he lifts up isles as fine dust. And Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for an ascending offering. All nations before him are as a non-entity. They are reckoned by him as less than a speck, an emptiness. To whom would you like an L? And what likeness would you compare to him? The workman molds a graven image, and the goldsmith overspreads it with gold. The silversmith casts silver chains. He who is too poor for such an offering chooses a tree that does not rot. He seeks for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare a carved image that does not totter. 
Did you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, who bring princes to naught, shall make the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Hardly have they planted, hardly have they sown, hardly has their stock taken root in the earth, when he shall blow on them and they wither, and a whirlwind take them away like stubble. To whom then do you liken me, or to whom am I compared, says the set-apart one? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these. He is bringing out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of ability and potent of power, a man is not lacking. Why do you say, O Yaakov, and speak, O Yisrael? My way is hidden from Yahuwah, and my rights are overlooked by my Elohim. Did you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting Elohim, Yahuwah, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall stumble and fall. But those who wait on Yahuwah, shall renew their strength. They rise up on wings like eagles. They run and are not weary. They walk and do not faint. That is the one we serve. That is the set-apart one of Yisrael. He does not weary. He will not faint. So even though we grow tired and we grow exhausted, he is our strength and our refuge in time of trials and tragedies. He is the fortress on which we stand, the rock on which we stand. You know what? These divisors of evils have no firm foundation. Their roots are shallow because they've been planted in sinking sand. And let me tell you, they will be blown over. They will be toppled over in the fierceness of His wrath. And you know what? He will deliver those who call upon Him cry out to him, who set their eyes on him. Listen to this. <sighs> they change the esteem of the incorruptible Elohim into the likeness of an image of a corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed beasts and of reptiles. Therefore Elohim gave them up to the uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to disrespect their bodies among themselves, who changed the truth of Elohim into the falsehood and worshipped and served what was created, rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Because of this, Elohim gave them over to, to degrading passions, for even their women exchanged natural relations for what is against nature. And likewise, the men also, having left natural relations with women, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing indecency, receiving back the reward which was due for their strain. Even as they did not think it worthwhile to possess the knowledge of Elohim, Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what is improper. He gave them over. That word is literally, He gave them over to vanity. He gave their minds over to vanity, to be consumed by it, to be ruled by it, to it become the thing with which they give their lives for. They sacrifice their lives on the altar of vanity. And this is literally the consequence of the curse of not giving Elohim reverence, esteem, to not value His Word, to not value Him and His input for your life. Like the principles that are laid out in the Torah, the loving instructions of Yahuwah, are there for our life. They're there for our good. They're not a burden. They're a blessing. They're not there to lead us to condemnation. They're there to lead us to understand who our Creator is and how to navigate the world, how to navigate how we love Yahuwah our Elohim with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, and how to love our neighbors as ourselves. But the vast majority of people have never, have no longer given regards to what this book has to say about how then we should live. There is a chapter in here, in Leviticus 14, on how to deal with mold. And the difficulty is the vast majority of our society disregards this. And because of that, 
huge amounts of people are incredibly sick, dying and diseased, suffering the consequences from not following out his commands on this. This is what he says to do with it. This is the Torah for one who had an infection of leprosy and who is unable to afford his cleansing. So you can go back in there. He's going to deal with garments. He's going to deal with bodily versions of this, right? Now he's going on to the physical burden, buildings. When you come into the land of Canaan, which I'm giving you as a possession, and I put a plague of leprosy or mildew, mold, in a house in the land of your possession, then shall one of the who owns the house come and inform the priest saying, it seems to me there is a plague in the house. The priest shall command and, the, and they shall empty the house. So here's the instructions on how to deal with it. Empty the house before the priest goes in to look at the plague so that all that's in the house is not made unclean. And after the priest goes in to look at the house, he shall look at the plague and see if the plague is in the walls of the house with sunken places, greenish or reddish, which appears to be deep in the wall. Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. The priest shall come again on the seventh day and look and see if the plague is spread on the walls of the house. Then the priest shall command and they shall remove the stones with the plague in them and shall throw them outside the city into an unclean place while he lets the house be scraped inside all around and the dust that they scrape off they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. They shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones and take other mortar and plaster the house. If the plague comes back and breaks out in the house after he's removed the stones, after he's scraped the house and after it's plastered, then the priest shall come and look and see if the plague is spread in the house. It's an active leprosy in his house. It is unclean. And he shall break down the house, its stones and its timber, and all the plaster of the house, and he shall bring them outside of the city to an unclean place. And he who goes into the house all the days while it's shut up becomes unclean until evening. He who lies down in his house has to wash his garments, and he who eats in the house has to wash his garments. However, if the priest indeed comes and looks and sees the plague is not spread in the house after the house was at plastered, then the priest shall announce the house clean, because the plague is healed. This is simple instructions that are incredibly hard to carry out. Like, this is literally what ruled my life last year. Last year, I had to do this with everything I owned in my house, my RV. I had to scrape its walls and take everything out of it and literally try to clean out to the very plywood, to the metal frame, the foam, the insulation. And I realized this is an absolute nightmare because the truth was I knew the, the way my RV was and the way almost every RV or even a lot of mobile homes are built, they're not designed to be a home. Like they're, they're not. They're designed to be a place that you live in for a while, but that's it. And so the mildew, mold, condensation, and all these other factors come into play so quickly. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to lose this entire house. I'm going to completely lose this thing if the mold comes back. And so, you know what? We got rid of it. I cleaned out all the mold that I could to the absolute best of my ability, and we got rid of it. I was like, this thing is, I cannot live in this again. My wife was so sick. She still can walk in. She's like a canary in the coal mine now. She can walk into a building, and within minutes, seconds a lot of times she'll get nauseous her eyes her vision will be blurry she'll have like a runny nose scratchy throat if there's like mold present active mold present like she can detect it very quickly and you know what there's a lot of people that live in that same space who are like i don't notice anything your body is still bearing a burden of being in a toxic environment you may be used to it but you also may just be used to feeling unwell that's not the same as living well it's two very different things her body went through such an incredible tax they nearly killed her. We had three months of living in a truly like mold-free environment. She, her health abounded. Like it was, it's unbelievable to see how much better she is, how much more vibrant she is. She's still not out of, she's still not cleaned like bodily of all of the toxins and all that. She's still not fully well, but she's so much better. Hi, Mom. See, Usnia likes to... It'll be on twigs that, twigs that you find on the ground, or it'll grow on the tree itself. You just pick it all off. Clean it all off. Like this big stick yeah, I found like, covered it's in it. It's literally everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. As soon as she goes into these environments, man, it's like breaks out of rashes and all this other stuff and exhaustion, the fatigue comes back, all these other like just 
incredible frustration stuff comes back with it. But you know what? It gives her the ability to tell where there's death in the house. And most people aren't like, I don't detect it yet. Well, sooner or later it's coming. You know what I'm saying? It's one of these silent killers that takes over people's lives. But if people actually dealt with their houses and their properties like, and took it seriously, this would be stopped. You could stop this plague from breaking out and continuing to carry on and again and again. Like we have friends whose children have, have incredible autoimmune disorders because of this. They, like others that can't speak. Like Jubilee's ability to speak and communicate just dropped off a cliff for like two months. We we're like, man, we didn't even really notice it until we had moved out of the environment for like a month last year. And we we're like, wow, Jubilee's talking again. Like she just had been so quiet for so long, we just not noticed it. But she had like, her speech had been diminished. Her ability to communicate had gone so far down. And we're like, this is just killing her. You know, she had a big breakout of mold that was just above her bed. And it was just like all of these little factors that you just don't know about. But if you're not taught to regard any of these things for a young age, none of this has any bearing to you. People mock these books in the scriptures. They mock it. They belittle it. And they're like, oh, it's stupid, worthless stuff for old people from previous times. That's the disp the doctrines of demon demons of dispensationalism. It's truly one of the most demonic doctrines that ever came along, which was to be like, you know what? Yahuwah doesn't work that way with us anymore, so we don't have to care about what he said. I literally had pastors sit down with me and tell me, open the Gospels up, like the book of Matthew, and be like, this isn't for us. You see, look, look, right in the beginning, he's talking about a different audience. Are you an Israelite? He's like, no, then it's not for you. Like he'd rent to the book of Hebrews. He's like, are you Hebrew? It's like, this isn't for you. Like they literally sat in front of me and were like, this was their discipleship course, by the way. They're like, you know, you've got some credentials. Let's, let's exalt you, young man. Let's lift you up because you are, the anointing is upon you. We're going to teach you what books we read in this Bible. And it's called the books of Paul and it's called the Gospel of John. Those are the books for us. Everything else they basically threw and used as garbage. Except for the book of Genesis. That was helpful for apologetics. But otherwise, let's poop on the rest of this book. Throw it out. Lots of people have ripped out pages of this Bible. For a reason, and that, doctrinally so. I've ripped out pages of this Bible to show people how to smuggle the Bible into places where it's oppressed. Watch my video called Tearing Up the Truth. Watch the whole thing. Don't get offended because I tear a page out of the Bible. There's lots of people that took out lots of pages. There's a lot of people that want to take out Romans 1 because it's got those verses about burning with lust for men and men. They don't like that stuff. They're like, no, no, don't use those. Don't use those. For a reason. The word convicts. Let's go back to the parable of the sower. Luke 18. Luke 8, verse 13. And those on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of trial fall away. And that which fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out, and are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to perfection. And that on the good soil are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, retain it and bear fruit with endurance. No one having lit a lamp comes. Man, just that's it. We have to endure. In order for this word, this word to bear forth its fruit in us, we have to endure. We have to endure. That's what it said in Romans 1. Ready? Oh, go to Romans 5. You ready for this? Therefore, having been declared right by belief, we have peace with Elohim through our master, Yeshua Messiah. Though through whom also we have access by belief into this favor in which we stand, and we will exalt in the expectation of the esteem of Elohim. And not only this, but we also exalt in pressures, knowing that pressure works endurance, and endurance approveness, and approveness expectation. An expectation does not disappoint, because the love of Elohim has been poured out in our hearts by the set-apart spirit which was given to us. For when we were still weak, that seedling in the horrible soil, Messiah in due time died for the wicked. For one shall hardly die for a righteous one. Though possibly for a good one, someone would even have the courage to die. But Elohim proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Messiah died for us. Much more than having now been declared right by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if being enemies, we were restored to favor with Elohim through the death of his son, much more having been restored to favor, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in Elohim through our master, Yeshua Messiah, through whom we now have received the restoration of favor. For this reason, even as the through one man, even as through one man, sin did enter into the world, and death 
through sin. Thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the Torah, sin was in the world, but sin is not reckoned when there is no Torah. But death reigned from Adam until Moshe, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. But the favorable gift is not like the trespass. For if by the one man's trespass many died, much more the favor of Elohim and the gift in favor of the one man, Yeshua Messiah, overflowed to many. And the favorable gift is not as by one having sinned. For indeed the judgment was one to condemnation. But the favorable gift is as of many trespasses unto righteousness. For if by the trespass of one, death did reign through one, much more those who receive the overflowing favor and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through the one Yeshua Messiah. You hear that? The good news? Through the death of one, we get to reign as with Messiah. This is why the immortals are battling so hard to suppress the gospel of deliverance, the power to save. The one that raises us up back to the position we are supposed to be in. That transplants us into the kingdom of life. So we can rule and reign with him. Like it says, to be seated with him in heavenly places. For as though, as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one, many shall be made righteous. And the Torah came in besides, so that the trespass would increase. But where sin increased... Favor increased still more, so that as sin did reign in death, even so favor might reign through righteousness, through everlasting life, through Yeshua Messiah, our Master. Man, what then shall we say? Shall we continue to sin so that favor increases? Let it not be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were immersed into Messiah Yeshua were immersed into his death? We were therefore buried with him through immersion into death, that as Messiah was raised from dead by the esteem of the Father, so also we should walk in the newness of life. Come on. For if we have become, come to be grown together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be of the resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was impaled with him, so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless to serve sin no longer. For he who has set, died has been made right from sin. And if we died with Messiah, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Messiah, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer rules over him. For in that indeed he died. He died to sin once for all. But in that he lives, he lives to Elohim. So you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to Elohim in the Messiah, Yeshua, our Master. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body to obey it in its desires. Neither present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to Elohim as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to Elohim. For sin shall not rule over you, for you are not under the law, but under favor. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under Torah, but under favor? Let it not be. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself, servants, for obedience? You are servants of the one whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. This fundamentally is why those that follow after these other gods, those that install the idols, these worthless idols of vanity in their hearts, they become slaves to them because they become servants, bond servants to sin fundamentally. Sin is the transgression of the Torah, 1 John. It's like the biblical definition is transgressing the Torah, like absolutely laid out. It is not falling short of the glory of God. That's not the biblical definition of sin. It is not an archery term for missing the mark. That's not the biblical definition. It's failing to follow his instructions. He gave commands. When we break those commands, we are sinning. Fundamentally, when we walk in humility and obedience to his ways, we are freed from the disobedience and freed from the world of sin. 
That's why when we obey the Messiah's instructions, when we obey his commands, how to love our neighbor, how to love Yahuwah, when we follow him and we imitate him, we become like him, we become free from the bondage of this world. We get transformed so we can have the mind of the Messiah. And we're exalted from this depleted, depraved state of despair. And we are lifted to this incredible spiritual gift of joy. And we are given the mind of the Messiah so that we can navigate these muddy waters of the world and we can find the pure living waters of life. Fundamentally, this is what we need in our life. This is what I need in my life. I need to preach the gospel of deliverance so that I can lift myself up from that place. And for those of you that are struggling in that place, hey, that's what the water of the word is. That's what the gift is. There's also wonderful other authors and writers and speakers that are out there to try who devote themselves to trying to lift people up from that place of non-reality, to try to give you the authentic. And you know what? I'm so thankful for them. I'm thankful for each and every one of you that does pray and intercede for our family on a regular basis. We could use all the backup we could possibly get right now. It's one of those seasons of great testing. But you know what? It's one of those seasons that we also rejoice in. My wife and I rejoice in the season of joy. We find joy in this season because we have an expectancy. I have like a promissory note with my king that this is going to bear forth fruit. And you know what? I want it to be good fruit. This is a season of pruning. Come and prune me, O master vine dresser. Come and prune me. Because you know what? I, that I might bear more fruit. That's why I want the pruning in my life. You should desire the pruning. Understand that that's what that season is for. We get pruned so we can bear more fruit. You know what? Speaking of which, I'll put out our fruit pruning with Billy class that we got to film back when I was wholesale ready to launch into the permaculture orchard thing. I'll get back to that. It's just the Reynolds got rerouted again. Another season of good, good change in our life. The Reynolds aren't always on the linen railroad. Sometimes we're on the struggle bus, but you know what? Praise be to Yah that we can always get back into the waters of life. May you all go live courageously. Fight the good fight of faith. Do the things that lead you back into the waters of the word. I love y'all. Talk to you soon.